I really have to listen now and, and pay attention after Bob read scripture like that. My gosh, what a powerful presentation. Thank you, Bob. So it is powerful. It is important. The word that we're concentrating as, uh, in that scripture is, of course, is bless. And blessings, you know, are a thing that are so easy to give. And yet, for some reason at times, we withhold them. Sometimes we're not quite sure if, uh, if they're appropriate for a moment. Well, I want to let you know, I, <laughs> any moment I think is an appropriate one to offer a blessing because they can be couched in so many different things. They can be, they can be uh, offered uh, as, a, as a way to uh, reassure someone or uh, a way to lift them up. They can be said in a way, I pray, to uh, offer perhaps your... your um, your uncertainty of perhaps even what to say in a moment. But a blessing is important for Jesus speaks that there are so many people who, who are blessed. And you have to assume his references that God is blessing them, that God is blessing these people in particular, the poor in spirit, those who mourn, those who are meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the people who are merciful. Wonderful. For those pure in heart. For the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted for speaking in Jesus' name. It happens, and it happens more often than you would think if you are speaking in Jesus' name. So it's an important thing for us to, to wrap our heart and eyes and arms and spirit around. It's so important that blessings be a part of our every day. I'm here to tell you we don't speak them enough. We should, this should be coming pouring out of our mouth at every moment we can. Because as, as somebody said a long time ago, uh, everyone is living a great struggle in their life. Everyone is. And so to offer a blessing is a wondrous, compassionate, and godly thing. I want you to hear another scripture that could have been read, uh, read today. From the book of Micah, you'll recognize its very last words. Hear what the Lord says. Rise, plead your case before the mountains and let the hills hear your voice. Hear you mountains, the controversy of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a controversy with his people, and he will contend with Israel. O oh my people, what have I done to you? In what have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses and Aaron and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember now what King Balak of Moab devised, what Balaam, son of Beor, answered him, and what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with the thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Now this, in many ways, is a scripture with which we need to seek or is being offered to us for restoration. So who needs restoration? Today the Bible speaks of the nation of Israel needing restoration. You heard God asking, what have I done to deserve this kind of treatment from you, O Israel? They have done wrong in the eyes of God. 
Now God, on the other hand, had saved Israel time after time after time, and yet they turned on God. Whether it was during the time of the enslavement in Egypt or the time when God had foretold Israel's destruction, God's self came to the rescue, changed the direction of the people of Israel. Now, a moment ago, I was speaking of the people of Israel, but I have to remind you, though, that unless when you read the Bible, unless you relate it to yourself, I think it's not going to have much meaning. <clears throat> Especially in the toughest times of your life. Each reading, reading in the Bible has to refer to you and you. And you, yes, you, and you, and you, and you, and you. It has to refer to you. Each reading, yes. It's to, it, it, it's as much as to uh, the people sitting behind me, and we have to take it to heart. So, uh, because the question has to be this. Where have I been wanting in my life of spirit and faith? Where have I feared to tread in matters that I just don't seem to have the time or the willingness to attend to? How can I act when I'm certain that others will disapprove of what I'm doing? Or worse yet, how can I act doing things that I have never understood to be my responsibility? thought it was the leader's responsibility. I'm just a follower. These are the internal questions which will trouble humankind no matter what. We will always be wondering what we should be doing to please our God. Or, if we don't even believe in God, we will always be wondering, what is it I need to be doing that's right? I know there are some people who are sick and who don't give a hoot about doing the right thing. However, most of us are always wondering that question. One of the simplest things comes from the Bible selection we heard today. What does Micah say? It says, what does the Lord require of you? What was the first thing, do you remember? But to do justice. Interesting thing that that was the first thing, friends. It wasn't say, it wasn't the Lord required of you to get down on your knees and pray and to be holy and to do all that. God asked first for what? Justice. Justice. Second thing, to love kindness. And the thirdly, to walk humbly with your God. It seems really simple. And it's obviously very lovely. But how obvious is such a statement? Doing justice and loving kindness and being humble to walk with God. These three things may not be as easy to live out as they are contemplated. Doing justice is a brave and lonely venture. Injustice is much more rampant in our society than any of us want to believe. Justice that scripture speaks about, though, is, is, is healing, is feeding, housing. We know that there are millions of people right here in the United States who are going without it, one or all of those things. Every night, you and I, I dare say not a single one here does not go to bed each night comfy, cozy, Warm, dry, and fed. You realize that there are people out there who aren't getting that stuff. In one sense, I want you to really take to heart the concept of that privilege. It is not what everyone gets. We have that privilege. We are constantly reminded by scripture, newspaper, television, and word of mouth of the people in our society and the world who go without. Yet, 
We can occupy our time and distract ourselves with, with Facebook or with uh, cocktail parties or with the garden or whatever. Not to say that any of those things are bad, but we have a tendency to lean on those a little bit too much. And we also want to be in the in crowd. We never want to be separated from anybody else. God forbid we be doing something that nobody else in town is doing. Now, loving kindness, this is even tougher, I think, strangely enough. How do we recognize kindness? Well, kindness is the opposite of hatred, is it not? Now, that would be, of course, hatred out of any camp. Now, I'm not, I mean, just because uh, there's hatred that's over here in a group of people that we already recognize that we don't like. But what about hatred coming from the group of people that we do like? Kindness is recognized by the many of the same acts which justice requires of us, but kindness forces us to change our thinking, though. To be a kind person, you have to make a decision to be kind. Real kindness finds its way into the pores of a person when they have decided it must be a part of their life. You've seen a kind person. You've even sometimes cringed at them. They're so kind. Sometimes we even try to avoid them. Oh my gosh, they're going to drag me along and make me be kind too. You know what I mean. Walking humbly with our God. What about that one? It has nothing to do with hiding our head, but it does have everything to do with knowing why we walk with God. If you're walking with God to curry favor from God, you might as well forget it, though. That's not the reason why we're supposed to be walking humbly with God. It's not the curry favor with God. If you're walking with God because you want to be seen as wonderful, forget it. Walking humbly with God is a manner in which a human finds fulfillment in an otherwise barren world. Walking humbly with God is the manner in which a person finds also favor with themselves. Walking humbly with God purges the soul of its selfishness, of its self-centered ways, of its ego. And instead, it points to spirit, to a purpose of righteousness and not recognition. Now, what I've said certainly can be construed as being an endorsement for living a life of total self-denial but I'm going to tell you it's the opposite. Really, honestly. Doing these things is not about denying the self. Doing justice creates a space in the cosmic balance of life for justice to be done unto you. Doing justice in our life creates a cosmic space for justice to be done unto you. Loving kindness makes others realize the kindness in you, making it almost impossible for them to not love you. Walking humbly with God gives you the peace with which your soul and your actions can coincide so that they can move at the same time and understand with uncanny certainty the meaning and consequences of divine providence. All these ways do not separate you from others. They bring you closer to everyone. But I have a warning. The more you understand, the more you love, the more you do justice, the more you walk humbly, the more you will see the true nature of others. You may even become discouraged. You may be getting closer and closer to truly knowing how humans take advantage of those who are weak, of those who are kind, of those who are humble, and you may even be taken advantage of also. Remember what it said in the scripture of the blessing, bless those who are persecuted for doing those things in my name. What? Does your God require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? 
A famous rabbi was once asked to put the meaning of the Bible, and remember when I say Bible, I mean what we call the Old Testament. To them, it is the Jewish scripture, the Hebrew scripture. To put it all into context, into one sentence, after some careful thought, he answered in this way, he said, do to others what you would want them to do, and the rest of the Bible is just commentary. Pretty good, pretty easy, right? Unless you're a masochist, that covers everything. Do to others what you would want them to do to you. And the rest is just commentary. This rabbi was wise, not just well-educated. He knew that the enormity of the book sometimes got in people's ways. In fact, though, it is God's word he knew that God probably would rather people listen to their hearts rather than referring to the Bible so darn often. Yep, I said it. We probably should be listening to our hearts more closely sometimes than having to refer to what the Bible says all the time. Not because the Bible's bad, but I think innately we all know what is right. We do. Do to others what you would want them to do to you. It seems so easy, yet we find ourselves dividing ourselves between us and them. Good and bad, full and hungry, clothed and naked, housed and unhoused. Right and wrong. Can we keep going on like this as humans and not make ourselves extinct? Well, I'll tell you what. It's an interesting thing. It would seem like we would drive ourselves extinct. The problem is, is that we've been doing this for a long time already. That's the problem. That's why we need the scripture. That's why we need Sunday mornings <laughs> or Saturday evenings for Jewish people or, or whenever <coughs> people gather to hear the ancient scriptures because the things that were happening now are the things that were happening back then. We're dealing with the same things and so we need <coughs> desperately to listen again and again. It's not, it makes us bad that we forget. It doesn't make us bad that we err. It just makes us human. So I ask you, how will you deal with the dilemma of justice, kindness, and walking humbly with God in your lifetime? Will you spend time on special equations and special formulas that are given to you to assure your way to heaven? Or are you going to listen to your heart? And don't listen to your hate. Sometimes it seems like our hate is our heart speaking. It is not. I think the word heart and hate are separated by one letter, the letter R. It's jumbled up a little different there. So are you ready to keep your life simple? by doing justice and loving kindness and walking humbly? I pray that you are. You are the people of God. I love you. I love your hearts. Open them up. Do not be afraid, for God is with you. My friends, May the Lord be with you. Let us